generally take it for granted that we will live forever. Indeed, we have to be thankful that we get up and we have this whole body still perfect. There are people who go to bed at night and does not get up. They don't get up anymore. So His Holiness Dalai Lama, one time he asked question, which one comes first, next life or tomorrow? Have you ever thought of it? So when, when, when we think in that, in that direction, we become more aware of the present. And we become more mindful of what we do today. When we practice, it's one day at a time. Don't worry about the future. If the present is very good, best, all kusala, all wholesome act, wholesome speech, wholesome mind, tomorrow will be even better. So we practice day, one day at a time. One day at a time. And one moment at a time. So just now we did experience a very short one moment together. And that one moment, there was no me, no I, and no you. Just the experience of one moment. Okay? The topic that Venerable Sujato uh, told me to speak is a different voice. I can jiggle around a, a lot with that large uh, space. I choose to share with you a story of Yasotara. Have you heard of her? Yasotara, who is this Yasotara? Yasotara was the Buddha's wife. But today I will choose to tell you her story, not history. History is written by men, about men and for men. So we, are start, we start to write a story about women from women's perspective. That's different voice. That's different voice. You know, you would be surprised when you read the whole, the, all the Buddhist texts, 45 volumes. Maybe you get one sentence about Yasotara being the Prince Siddhartha's wife. And she was the mother of Rahula. But who she was? We hardly know about her because the story of Buddhism focuses on the Buddha, right? The biography was the biography of the Buddha, not about his wife. So tonight, we will hear a different voice. I was trained as an academic. Always have reference. You know, when academic writes paper, always footnotes, you know, where to find footnotes. When I write this paper, it was quite daring as an academic not to have any footnotes. But then the academic would look at me and said, well, she just write out of her own imagination. I challenged the academic. Yes, what I'm telling you, many, many things that I will be telling you is not in the text. But the academic have to prove that what I say is wrong. You get the point? It's very difficult to prove me wrong because I'm speaking from women's point of view and I'm speaking from getting that close feeling with Yasotara of what she was going through in her life. With my background living in India, feeling the feeling, the experience of Indian culture and society. So I'm telling, I will be telling you the story of Yasotara from a different perspective, from a different voice that you have heard before. The Buddha's lineage came from way back from Ogagaraja. Ogagaraja had nine children four boys and five girls. And then when he got married to his second wife, I don't know whether what happened to the first wife, maybe the first wife died. 
when he got married to the second queen, a son was born. And this son was maybe about one year old, a very cute boy, you know. So he did something that the king was very happy, very pleased. So he said, whatever you ask, I will give you. So the second queen took this opportunity to ask the king for the throne. So the king haven't said that I will give whatever you ask, had to give the throne to the youngest son of the second wife. So the first wife, children, four, four sons and five daughters, all, apparently all of them were grown up. So he requested them to leave the kingdom and start a new one. So four brothers and five sisters moved out and started a new kingdom and later on came to be known as Kabilavastu. Whereas the other one started, uh, now, uh, this is what happened. I said just now that five, five sisters and four brothers, this is what happened. The four brothers got married to the, fa the four sisters. So there is one eldest sister who was not married, she, so she was highly respected by all her siblings. But she had some kind of skin disease, so she had to leave the country, and, and eventually she got married to another king and started Devadaha. Long lineage, you know, that did not happen in one generation, but many generations, and that's how they created Devadaha. So you have on one side Kabilavastu, another side Devadaha. Both of them are from Sakyan family, and they always marry within. Okay, now the time of uh, Prince Siddhartha, when he became of age, he was 16 years old, so the father was looking for the right woman for, for him. They could not find any young woman who would be appropriate to give to the prince in Kabilavastu. So they looked for someone from Devadaha. In Devadaha, there was this Princess Yasotara. So Princess Yasotara married the young prince uh, Siddhartha, both of them same age, 16. Mind you, they were born on the same day, exactly same age. Seems to have a happy life. We don't know much about them between the age of 16 until the age of 29. I questioned that too long, 13 years. Uh, Something happened, something did not happen, we don't know. We just believe that they did have happy life together. It was at the age of 29 when the Prince Siddhartha started. He, he, has, he had always been highly philosophical type of a person, thinking about life and death, thinking about the meaning of life. And as it was told to us that he actually took these four trips to the city, and he came across a person who was ill, a person, a aged person, you know, old person, and a death, you know, a corpse on the way. And he kept asking his charioteer whether this is, this is going to happen to me also. You know, you see a sick person, everyone must be like this. Do I get sick like this also? And the question is, the answer is always affirmative. Yes, all of us will be sick, all of us will be old, all of us will have to die eventually. The fourth one, he saw this one ascetic, very peaceful and very calm, sitting on underneath the, the, the tree. So he got an idea that maybe this kind of lifestyle, how come this man, he's sitting there so peacefully, so calm and so peaceful, maybe this is the way to come out of this suffering. So this idea of suffering, was bothering him a lot. How am I to overcome the suffering of getting sick, getting old, and death? That was the quest. And this quest is existentialist in nature. It is true for him, and it is true for us. It is actually true for all human beings. This quest become real to us also. Eventually, at the age of 29, a son was born. And when he was pondering about how am I to overcome this suffering, the message came that a son is born. So he exclaimed, Rahula, 
Rahula means bondage. Traditionally, people would explain that a son is a bondage to the, the parents. But I would go one step to say that actually he felt that a son is now equally trapped, just like him. He is being trapped in this quest of how am I to get out of this suffering of getting old, getting sick, and death. My son now is born, and he is equally trapped. Thinking in that direction, this is a time I have to leave. This is a time I have to go in search of truth. How am I to overcome this suffering? So in all the, the, the paintings, in all the art, uh, mural painting, in different temples, we see him peeping from the window, sorry, peeping from, from the door, looking at his wife, sleeping with the baby, newborn baby. Imagine if he, get, if he came close to them, woke up the wife, carried the baby. Maybe he will never, ever let go. You know, if once you could feel the baby in your arms, the love, the attachment will be so intense that he could not give up. The real story, we don't know. But that's how the artist portray, that he just looked from the window, and that's it. I have to leave tonight. So he left. The rest of the story you know. We have read the story of the Buddha. Six years afterwards, he became the Buddha. But tonight, we are going to hear the story of Yasotara. So Yasotara, being removed from Devadaha, had that great attachment to her husband, hoping that her husband would come and rejoice with this newborn baby. It's a gift. You know, a boy is born. This is a gift. This is the best thing that a woman can give to her husband's family by giving birth to a boy. And that's what she did. He didn't come. That night, she waited for him. He didn't come. She slept early in the morning. She was hoping that he would come and at least take a look at the baby. At least give her a hug. So telling her how thankful he was to bring about this Rahula, the baby. Late in the morning, still he did not come. So she was... Every time when the door is open, she would be looking whether it's going to be the prince, her husband. Finally, somebody came, and it turned out to be Mahapajapati. That's the, the mother. Mahapajapati came, and she praised her with all kind of things, you know, giving her all the praise, a bit too much. You know, that uh, she gave birth to this Rahula, the baby, and the queen came, rejoiced, but was praising her for being so brave, for being so gentle, for being so kind, for being so khanti, what is khanti? Uh, patient, that she, she was so patient and all that. Hmm. A bit too much. Then she was trying to look at the lady in wait. None of them would meet her eyes. They all, you know, turned down their eyes, did not want to meet her eyes. And then finally the queen came forward and said, my dear niece, I have to tell you that Prince Siddhartha left last night. What? How can he leave me when I brought the best gift that I could give in to him and he left me like this? What have I done? What wrong have I done that he left me when I just brought out the baby to him. She could not show her tears to all the lady in waits, so she went inside into her room and cried her heart out. What have I done that my husband left me? So she was thinking over and over. The only thing that consoled her was her son, that she had to take care of the baby. So that was her duty. That was her duty. In the palace, there were gossips around. Oh, look, the husband just left when she just gave the baby, just gave birth to a baby, and the husband left. She must have done something wrong, so much that her husband could not stand her, and he left. 
So that was the rumor that was going on in the palace. She endured all this hardship. The king sent the soldiers, batch, batch of soldiers, after the prince to see what the prince is up to now. The soldiers came back to report, now he cut off his hair. <gasps> he removed his hair. He removed the jewelry. And he gave the jewelry back to the, with the charity who went with him to return to the king. It is a message that I am not returning to the palace anymore. She did not understand that he was going in search of this, what you call, spiritual enlightenment that was not in her vocabulary. She did, an, uh, did not understand that. Then the, the message came again that now he is very thin because he was not eating. So she refused to put on any jewelry. She refused even to do her hair. You know, they always braid their hair and make a beautiful bun, decorate their hair beautifully with flowers. She refused all that. Because what use is there for a, for a wife to decorate herself when there is no husband to enjoy her beauty? You know, Indian women, they always have this tikka. Tikka is a sign of a blessing that you are married, you have a husband. And this red sign on the parting of the hair, that is a sign of a married woman. She did not put no tikka and no, no red color on the hair parting. Because no more tree, SRI tree, the auspiciousness in her life is gone. So she is not in a position to dress herself up anymore. So she was dressed always in white, just like a widow, you know, someone whose husband died. No more jewelry, no more decoration. And when the news came that he is now fasting, she also fasted. She also started to eat only raw grains and maybe one meal a day just to keep herself going. So that was a kind of practice. The rumors, the gossips in the palace went on and she had to endure for the, for the son. Rahula was now then six years old. The news came that now Prince Siddhartha is enlightened. Oh, so he got what he want. He got what he went out for. So she was hoping that he will come back. Now he got what he want, so he's coming back. So she was waiting, preparing herself to welcome her husband. He did not come. He went yet another year, visiting different places, you know, proclaiming his teaching. King, uh, King Sutotana sent out many groups of soldiers to invite the Buddha back to the palace. First one disappeared. Second one disappeared. What happened to these soldiers? was when they went to the Buddha, they listened to the sermon, they all gave up and became monks. Second one, third one, until the eighth one, until the ninth one. Now, the ninth one is Udayi. Udayi is, uh, he was born at the same time with the Buddha also, and very close uh, soldier. So the king told him, whatever you do, you must remember to bring back the Buddha, to bring back your prince back to, the, to, to Kabilavastu. Udayi also, after listening to the first sermon, he also became monk. But he remembered the words that he gave to the king to bring back. So he invited the Buddha, invited the Buddha to return to Kabilavastu. The first thing, the news came when the Buddha was approaching Kabilavastu. The princess was so overjoyed to know that now her husband is coming back. So she was looking from the window, you know, looking for him as he walked in, in town. He was coming for arms round. Bintabad is not understood in that time. So they were just saying that he came out begging with all this retinue of monks. Begging, can you imagine? Sakaya don't, don't, number one, they don't beg. Number two, they don't eat with other people, other caste. They are so pure in, their, in preserving their own lineage. They don't eat food that is cooked by others. Not to talk about going out begging, eating food that is offered by all caste. 
not possible. Not possible to think of this prince doing this. So in the palace, they were criticizing, look at him. He came back and he must have gone out of his mind to be begging like this. This is not what the Sakyan would do. This is not our culture. So when the Buddha came to the palace gate, nobody wanted to pay him respect. Nobody. It was until the king, who was the most senior of the Sakyan, paid respect to the Buddha. Only then it forces all the princes and all the princes to bow to the Buddha. And the, fa the king father actually asked the Buddha not to do this. You know, you don't, you don't go out begging. Then the Buddha confirmed to him that this is the practice of the Buddhas in the past. This is, what, this is our tradition. This is the Buddhist tradition. This is the Buddha's tradition. Then he accepted invitation to come for meal the next day, dana, next day. So he came, and after he received dana, finished dana, he started giving dharma talk. But he recognized that in this crowd, he was looking for his wife, Yasotara. She was not there. She was not there. So he inquired, what happened to Prince Yasotara, Princess Yasotara? So the king sent the lady in wait, you know, to go and invite, invite her. The lady in wait came and told the king that she refused to come. This is in the text. She refused to come. So this is the first time when you read the history, a Buddhist history, that somebody said no to the Buddha. And it was she who said no to the Buddha. I, I wrote one paper, she who challenged the Buddha. As soon as the message came that she said no, the Buddha understood right away. Right away he understood that he said, yes, I'm coming to the inner palace where she was staying. And then he turned around to Mokalana and Sariputra. This is in the text. Turn around to him. Whatever form of greetings that she is giving to me, you don't interfere. It's my business. I will handle it. You don't interfere. So, so he went. And with the whole, the whole group of people, you know, the monks and also the king and the queen and all the royal families. As soon as he approached her, back to their home now. That palace was his home and her home. She came out and she let loose her long hair and she bowed to his feet and wiped his feet with her long hair. Just try to visualize that. Very moving. He lifted her up like this, you know, and put her, put her on the proper seat. And when everyone was seated, he chose to preach Ginra Sutra, Ginra Jataka, Ginra Jataka. Ginra is a half bird and half man. So that was their previous life together. And why he chose to teach, to preach Ginra Jataka. In that story of Ginra Jataka, both of them were half bird and half, half human being. She was very beautiful, Ginri. Female is Ginri. Very beautiful Ginri. And one time she was captured and offered to the king of Varanasi, Brahmatat, Brahmadatta. And as the king approached her, wanting to make a wife out of this woman, you know, she, out of purity, out of her purity and her honest to her husband, uh, the, the heat was coming out her, from her body, and the king could not touch her, could not touch her. And she refused food, refused to eat, until she became very thin. So eventually, king of Varanasi realized that he cannot do anything with this woman, better send her back. So eventually she was sent back to, to uh, Himalayan mountain and joined with her husband. And then they moved further in, you know, so that they will not be bothered by this by these uh, human beings. And he praised her that in that life, that she was a ginnery, she was so honest to him, and she always keep her, uh, how to say, endured all the hardship in order to, re to be back with her husband. She was the best of wife. She was the best of wife. This is what? This is giving a guarantee that whatever the gossip that was going on in the palace, I confirm that this is the best of wife that I have had, not only in this life, but also in all the previous life that I have born together with her. So this is a confirmation. And that's what, 
Yes, Lord Ra, need it. Her husband to say this to the public, to the royal people that have been gossiping around her, behind her back for so long. So she was very happy, very happy. She did not, maybe that time, she did not really realize so much about what does it mean to be a Buddha. But it was her husband who came home, looked very handsome, looked very manly now because he's darkened, you know, his skin, his complexion is darkened and very beautiful. And he now placed her back to her right position as a good wife, as a worthy princess. Then that night he returned with the whole retinue of monks to Nikrota Rama outside Kabilavastu. The next day he came for arms round again. She sent Rahula. She sent Rahula. Look, that man who is walking ahead of everyone else, that is your husband. You go and ask for Dayacha. Dayacha means the lineage, heritage. So the little boy Rahula went, seven years old Rahula went, tucking the rope of the Buddha. My father, I'm coming for the heritage, your heritage. The Buddha hold his hand, one, one hand he was holding the bowl, one hand he hold the, the little boy, and walked him way back to Nikrota Rama and gave the baby, gave the boy to Sariputra. To do what? To become Samanera. The best heritage that I can give to my son that will make my son happy, truly happy in his life, is to give him ordination. So Sariputra gave him ordination and he became Samanera, novice. The first, the first novice in Buddhist history. What happened to the palace? The grandfather, the grandmother, the mother were all in tears. The king actually came to see the Buddha and asked the Buddha that next time when you give ordination to young boys, young girls, at that time there were no girls yet, young boys, ask permission from the guardian. He could not say ask permission from the parents because the, the, father, the, key, the Buddha was the father. So you must get permission from the guardian. So this become one of our sikapata, one of our rules that when we give ordination to young boys, young girls, we must get permission from their parents, from their guardians. And the Buddha actually, in this particular case, was one who caused this rule to be laid down. Then the Buddha left, returned to his wherever he was going. And then he came back to Kabilavastu the second time when the king was very ill. And he came and he did his best duty as a son to take care of the, the father in his last stage. And actually through his preaching, the king became enlightened and the queen became Sotapanna, entered the first stream. Uh, stream winner. Nothing was mentioned about Yasotara, but we could, we could visualize that Yasotara was somehow in the background of all this. So when, when the king died and Mahapajapati asked for ordination, the Buddha did not give it right away, but eventually he gave the ordination. And Yasotara somehow also joined, joined the order of Pikunis, not at the same time as Mahapajapati, maybe one year later, but she did join. And she became very good teacher, very good teacher. And she was praised by the Buddha for being foremost in Maha Apinya. Apinya is the ability the, of supernatural power, six different kind of Apinya having divine eyes, divine ears, you can see in the, to the past, you can read people's mind, you know, performing miracles. But she was even greater than any other people because there is the word Maha Apinya, not just ordinary, not ordinary supernatural power, but special kind. She's the only one, only one in the female section that received this praise from the Buddha. So she was one of the, she, she's known as Eta Thakha, you know, one who is being foremost. At the age of 78, same age as the Buddha, she thought that now I am of the same age 
with the Buddha, my teacher, my great teacher, I should pass away before him. And that is a sign of respect. Should not be passing away after the Buddha or at the same time as the Buddha, but choose to pass away before him. So she came and paid respect to the Buddha and asked permission to pass away, to die, so to say. You know what the Buddha said? The Buddha accepted and gave her permission to, to pass away, but he requested her to perform miracles. Now you know when you read Buddhist texts, the Buddha always told his, his disciples not to engage themselves in miracles. But in this particular case, he requested her to perform miracles. Why? Why? Because when he gave her that title of being best in Apinya, nobody knew. Nobody knew except him. So this was the only time that he asked her to perform miracles in front of all the pikus and pikunis, so that they also will see with their own eyes, Sachika Tunti, see it with their own eyes, that she really was great. You know? So she performed miracles. She uh, would, go up, would go up on in the air. And actually, uh, it's like you are watching a, a video of the previous life that she was born with the Buddha. In each life, she would bow to the Buddha. And then the last one, there were 1,000 Yasotra on the sky, and all of them bow to the Buddha. Bow to the Buddha. And then when she finished that, she came down in person and bowed to the Buddha, said the last goodbye to him, and then she retreated. Back to her goody, small goody, just like, oh, the one you have in Santi Monastery is too big. Oh, her, her goody was small very small, tiny one. And then she passed away in meditation, sitting meditation. The Buddha cremated her, arranged beautiful funeral, cremated her, worthy of female disciple, worthy of her status as a princess. So this is the story of Yasotara, that we seldom hear about it. So, I would like to recite just one small passage uh, in praise of Yasotara. When she was ordained, she is known as Pattakajana. So I will do the chanting of a small one. Just to, to end the talk before you start asking questions. There are all together 13 of them, and we did in Sandy Forest Monastery, we did praise of the 13 Arahateris. I will just do the piece of Yasotara. Teri to Patakajana Mahapinyana Muttama Chine Nasoka to Kangsa Sataso Tinkaro to know. So in praise of her being foremost in the position as uh, being foremost in Maha Apinya. And she was Chinena Sukha Tukangsa. She was the one who had shared with the, Chinena is the Buddha, shared with the Buddha both her, her happiness and her suffering together with him in so many, many lives. So with that, we pay respect to her and we ask her blessing to every one of you.